Hello, everyone. So my name is Gabriela Livanos, and I am Vice President of the Psychology Club here at UNC Asheville. And on behalf of the Psychology Club and the Psychology Department, I am so pleased to be able to welcome all of you, literally all of you, because I love how packed this room is, to this lovely lecture that is to be given by Dr. Hal Herzog on why do humans, and only humans, keep pets? So, Dr. Herzog is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Psychology at Western Carolina University, our neighbor, and he has many admirers here at UNC Asheville and beyond, he's very popular. He has been investigating psychological, biological, cultural, and ethical aspects of human-animal relationships for over 30 years. His research has included studies of the psychology of animal activism, gender differences in human-animal interactions, and the impact of pets on human health. His articles have appeared in journals such as The American Psychologist, Science, Biology Letters, Behavioral and Brain Sciences, and The Evolution and Human Behavior. And his research has been covered in many media outlets, including The New York Times, The Washington Post, The London Times, New Scientist, National Public Radio, and BBC Television. His book, Some We Love, Some We Hate, Some We Eat, Why It's So Hard to Think Straight About Animals, has been translated into nine languages, and he writes the blog Animals and Us for Psychology Today magazine. So without further ado, we would love to welcome Dr. Hal Herzog. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Number one, can you all hear me? Yes. You hear me in the back, OK? Okay, great. Um, I'm so glad to be here. Uh, I love UNCA. I've got friends that work here. My daughter has a degree, a degree from, U, from UNCA, and uh, I've loved coming to campus for visiting lectures and things like that. So I, I, th I think very highly of, of, uh, of the institution where you are. And today what I want to talk about is uh, the psychology of human-animal interaction, specifically our relationships with, our relationships with pets. And increasingly, pets are considered family members. 65% of American homes include a companion animal. 80% of people think of their pets as family members. This is sort of sad, but in one study, 43% of married women said that they get more emotional support from their, is this thing working okay? I don't need that, do I? Um, that they get more emotional support from their, husband, from their dog than they do their husbands or their kids. And then 56% of pet owners would not sell their pet for a million dollars. Now, how many of you are pet owners? How many of you would sell your pet for a million dollars? I am with you. This is, my, this is my cat. This is my cat, Tilly. She's a real sweetheart. I would sell her for a million dollars. She's for sale. If you have that kind of cash and you want a really, really sweet cat, she's for sale. Now, by the way, I mentioned that the other day at a talk that I was giving, and somebody raised her hand, and she said, would you sell her for a million dollars if you knew she was going to go to a horrible research labs and use them biomedical experiments? And I was talking about my, this, my wife last night, and um, she said no immediately. But I had to think about it a little while, and then I, I said no, too. I looked Tilly in the face and said no. So if you're going to take her to a research lab, the, 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 the bet's off. You can't have her. But, Psychologists generally have ignored human-animal interactions. Social psychology textbooks don't mention this important aspect of people's lives. Developmental psychology textbooks don't mention this. Intro psych uh, books don't mention this. And um, why is that the case? And I'm going to give a nod to uh, my hero in psychology, Paul Rosen. And one of the th reasons I love UNCA so much is about three years ago, four years ago, I get a call from Paul Rosen my hero in psychology, who says, how, I'm going to be giving a talk at UNCA. You think we could go out and have dinner tonight? And it was like, it was like if Bob Dylan had called and said, like, hey, how, <laughs> going to be in town. You want to sit in on my gig at the Civic Center tonight? That's how I felt about Ryzen. So thanks for bringing Paul Ryzen here. It was the best dinner of my life. <laughs> um, but Paul argues that psychologists have erred in some ways because of our focus on what he calls processes rather than domain. So processes, things like you know, learning, cognition, perception, memory, the things that development, you know, things that you have courses in. And what Rosen argues is that we ignore things that are really important to people, like what they eat. And that's where he's basically made, done most of his research. We know our relationship with food, 
Religion's an important aspect of people's lives. That's just an obscure area. There's not many people working in it. Even sex is, an, is, is, a, an, is a domain of human life which has not received much attention from psychologists. And human-animal interactions are similarly in that category. For example, how, for how many of you is your pet a really, really important part of your life? Exactly. So we, this situation is changing. And so now there's this new field called anthrozoology. It deals with the science. It's basically the social and biological sciences associated with our relationships with animals. We have journals, six or seven journals in the field. Increasingly, our articles are showing up in mainstream psychology journals. We have a, a scholarly organization, the International Society for Anthrozoology. Hundreds of courses on human-animal interactions are being taught in a wide variety of majors in colleges and universities. The American Psychological Association has a section on human-animal interactions. And the NIH, and this has been a big shot in the arm, is now funding, has a major funding project in this area. By the way, how many of you are psychology majors? I'm kind of curious about that. Great, OK, good. Um, the degree to which this field has taken off is absolutely baffling and stunning to me. So when I first started doing work in this area, which was back in this time, there were, this is the number of articles published in scientific journals uh, by year from 1980 to, 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 to last year. And as you can see, you know, back in the 1980s, we're talking you know, a handful of papers published each year in the field, and now we're pushing 1,000 a year. So this is a growth area in terms of research in psychology and other social sciences. Um, the anthropologist Claude, uh, uh, Claude Levi-Strauss said animals are good to think, that, think with. And the reason I'm mentioning that is there's a number of people, reasons that people get into this area of research. Most of my colleagues uh, that study the same things I do, they're in the field because they, they love animals. Their main thing is that they're animal lovers and they want to try and understand our relationship with animals because of that. That's not my reason. I study this stuff because to me it offers this window into human psychology, which is fascinating because as I'm sure you know, uh, animal, human animal relationships bring out the best and the worst in people. And so what we see is people are incredibly passionate about these you know, conflicts, moral conflicts over the politics of it. They're passionate about their own pets. Some, pe some, they some animals we like to kill, some animals we like to eat. Um, so it's a very, very morally complicated area. So I, what I want to do today is I want to look at anthrozoology, our relationships pet, with pets, as a way of dealing with issues in human nature generally. And so this raises big issues. Are we really the only animals to keep pets? Does this mean that we're somehow different? Are we, are we different than other animals? Is our love for animals the result of biology, or is it more impacted by culture? And then finally, what I want to deal with is what light does our choices in pets shed on sort of cultural evolution generally? So there's, there's the, the small stuff that I'm going to talk about, and then, there's, and then there's the big stuff. So let's look at the big stuff. The big question here, the big theme is, why do we keep pets? So we can talk about these questions at a different, different types of levels. So one level is the proximate level. So, why do you love your pet? Who's got a pet? Who's, who loves their pet? Why do you love your pet? Because she's relaxing. Because she's, she's relaxing. Anybody else love their pet? Why do you love your pet? Um, it's nice to me. Your pet's nice to you? It cares about me. Is this a cat or a dog? Cat. Your cat cares about you? <laughs> oh my god. You're the luckiest guy here. <laughs> So you, you know, and what people commonly say is that, they love, is that pets give us unconditional love. My argument about that is that dogs might give you unconditional love, but your cat is an exception. My cat does not give me unconditional love. My love for her is unconditional, with the exception of the, uh, that I would sell her for a million bucks. But for the most part, she treats me like something that opens the door and lets her out and stuff like that. And I, I put tons of affection on her. So these types of explanations are what we call proximate explanations. They're the immediate reason that we love our pets. So for example, a survey, recent Gallup survey, asked Americans why they say they have pets. And what you can see is that uh, high on that list is companionship, although it's interesting, there's a big difference between that red is dogs and, and green is cats. 
that they love animals, that one of their family members, they, you know, it might be a mom that says, man, I didn't want the cat, but it was, you know, I didn't want the dog, but it was good for the kids. Protection, fun, and rescue animals. It's interesting that more people pick rescue animals because of, that, that own cat than, that, cats than, that, that own dogs. But this is the proximate level, the immediate reasons why we live with animals, why, why we keep them in our lives. The ultimate question is different, and this is what I'm gonna concentrate on today. What are, the, what's, what are the evolutionary roots of our love for animals? So when we talk about the, uh, the ultimate questions, we're talking about issues like, how does pet love enable us to survive and reproduce better? You know, what are the sort of evolutionary origins? Can we look at the roots of pet loves in our closest relatives, for example, monkeys and apes? Um, and then to what degree, if, if, if a trait has evolved, it's gotta be under some sort of genetic control, to some extent at least. So what's the degree of genetic control in our affection for animals? So, and to me, th this raises an interesting question. I have tons of colleagues, both in animal behavior and also my field of human-animal interactions, who will argue, look you straight in the face and say that there's no fundamental difference between humans and animals. And that's an argument that my friends that are uh, animal rights activists frequently make to me. And the question is, are they right or are they wrong? And this is the question of human exceptionalism. Are we different? Are we different from all the other millions of species, uh, millions of, species of animals on Earth? Now, I take uh, my nod here from the psychologist Dan Gilbert, Harvard psychologist who wrote a book on happiness. And Dan Gilbert, in his book on happiness, has a sentence that really caught my attention. Every psychologist who takes a pen to paper someday writes a sentence that says, humans are the only animal that. And I found myself writing that sentence. When I was writing this book, I found myself writing the sentence, humans are the only animal that. And what, is, what you see normally is the that, is things like use language, use tools, things like that. And, and, and a lot of the terms, these are things that animals also, also do. But my answer to the question is that we are the only animal to keep pets. Now, my guess is, is that some of you are immediately thinking, this guy is wrong. And what you, how many of you are thinking that right now? Fess up. Not many, You're, the rest of you are liars, you're mostly thinking that, because you know about Coco's kitten, right? Aww. Aww. You know, Coco was the gorilla, Coco was the gorilla who adopted this cat, which it ended badly. Cat got killed in a car accident, I think, got hit by a car, and she, but she got a new one. Suri and Roscoe, this is a orangutan and a hound dog. I've met Suri and Roscoe. You might have seen them on the Super Bowl commercials last year. They're on the TV a lot. Uh, and then there's, there's books, and if you, if you go to YouTube, and you just Google, or, you, know, go, you put in the, in, the, in the search bar, you know, animal odd couples, you will get thousands of, of, of you know, clips of you know, lions and lambs and elephants and dogs that have become best friends and, th and things like that. The problem is that all these involve cases of human intervention. For example, let's take, <laughs> I love when people go, ah. <laughs> let's take that cute little, that cute little chimpanzee uh, with playing with that, that puma. That's, that's a baby cougar, by the way. And I met them. In fact, one of my, the thrills of my life was, uh, you know, little kids don't like me when they see me. Oftentimes they cry and run away and stuff like that. And I was part of this BBC film shoot on animal odd couples. And we're at this private zoo in South Carolina. And this chimpanzee, this baby ch young chimpanzee, took one look at me from about 40, 40 feet away and just made a beeline for me and jumped into my arms. It was. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I wanted to cry, it was, it was the cutest thing I've ever, I've ever seen. So, so it turns out, so it turns out that, our, that this, that chimp and that, that puma, they are pretty good friends. But this was put together by a professional circus animal trainer. We didn't know that at the time when we did, were doing the film shoot because they portrayed it as the, the same as Roscoe and the orangutan. They portrayed this as this, oh, we had our orangutan out and this hound dog sort of came up and they started playing together and they became fast friends. Well, that's not quite what happened. A professional animal trainer has made a living by putting these things together and then putting them in books and putting them on television. So, but 
they, animals very clearly can form close relationships with members of other species, but they don't seem to do it in the wild. So why don't animals in the animal why don't animals in the wild keep pets? Now, I, you know, my, I've been, I was making this argument and uh, made a similar argument in my book, and my friend James Serpel from the University of Pennsylvania <laughs> sent me this with no comment, sent me this paper, that obscure paper that had come out in the Primate Journal, and it was the story of, an amazing story of Fortunata. And a woman named Jean Shirley was an amateur naturalist who was at this uh, rainforest in Brazil, and she was a great, really good photographer. And she stumbled on a group of capuchin monkeys, a dozen or so capuchin monkeys, and they had apparently adopted a baby marmoset. So capuchin monkeys are about this big. They're really smart, amongst the smartest of primates other than us. And these marmosets are like this big. Well, these guys had adopted this baby marmoset, and you can, which they named, which they named, the researchers began to study this, Fortunata. You can see Fortunata here. This, she's, feeding, she's feeding this Fortunata. Here Fortunata is being carried around on this uh, capuchin's, capuchin's back. Here this capuchin mama is cuddling this member of a completely different, they're not even, not only, they're in different genera. They're not even the same, the, the same genus. This was not a one-off. This relationship occurred, went on for 14 months. And then one day Fortunata disappeared and nobody knows what happened to her. So to me, this is the exception that proves the rule. Chimpanzees could keep pets if they wanted to. If a capuchin could do it, so could a chimpanzee. They're way more smarter than a capuchin, but they don't seem to do it. In fact, every case in which chimpanzees adopt a pet, I recently came across a wonderful YouTube video recently, which was called, was on a nature series called Love, and they showed this chimpanzee, which adopted a little, uh, gosh, what was it? It was a little bush, oh, it was a, a, a guinnet cat, this little kitten, African kitten cat, and you could see it holding it, protecting it for their chimps, and it, it looked great. Well, I contacted the researcher in Africa, in Senegal, who actually, where, her, where this was filmed, I said, well, what actually happened? What actually happened was the other chimpanzees ripped it apart after they had shot in this clip. So they, the, the, you know, the nature series called it love, but if they had taken the video 15 minutes later, it would have been like de you know, death, you know, death. We, we rip, they ripped it apart and ate it. So, so, and that happens time after time after time when chimpanzees adopt, so-called adopt, adopt the pet. It doesn't spread. So the question, the evolutionary question is, why do we invest in creatures that we share no genes with when other people, others, others don't? Well, first of all, pet keeping is expensive. You probably don't want to know this if you have a pet, but that pet, over the lifetime of the pet, is probably going to cost you about $11,000. Uh, dogs and cats surprisingly cost about the same amount of money uh, because cats live longer, live, longer than, live longer than dogs do. In addition to that, there's the problem of living with predators. For example, my cat, is a stone cold killer. I once saw her take down a hummingbird. And I was torn between the emotion of, this is terrible, you killed this bird. And the other half of me was saying like, you go girl, man, you got, man, it's a, it's a feat of athleticism that was stunning. <laughs> ripped, ripped the thing right out of the sky. Then there's dogs. And uh, dogs in the United States uh, bite about, about Three million people a year. About 500,000 500, people are taken to the hospital. And each year, between two and three dozen Americans are killed by dogs. And in a really tra this happens locally, too. Uh, two years ago, there was a seven-year-old boy that was killed by a, uh, an animal that his family had just adopted from the Asheville Humane Society, which had passed their nice dog test. So, so we have that problem. Um, so what are the theories that, what are the theories that have been, you know, come up with to explain the evolution of pet keeping? Well, one of the theories, I'm going to mention, there's, there's a bunch, but I'm going to mention, I think, four of them. One is uh, an idea that was put forth by uh, the Harvard, great Harvard naturalist, uh, E.O. Wilson, back in the 1980s, 1982, wrote a little book called Biophilia. And what he argues is that humans have an innate tendency to focus on life and lifelike processes. And so he called it biophilia, which I'm not sure was the greatest word to use because it implies that you like animals, or you love them, like for example, pedophilia is attraction to children. 
But he, was say, he wasn't saying loving necessarily. He meant that we sort of rivet on these things. That's my grandchild. I just took this picture a couple, couple of weeks ago, actually. And um, he was in, it was really quite stunning. I was really taken. He's two and a half years old. Hudson's two and a half years old. And we're going for a walk in his neighborhood. And they had a woman out there, and she, had, she raised rabbits. And she had a, a baby bunny. Now, that, that bunny was so, can you see the bunny? It's just a little ball of fur. Its eyes aren't even open yet. So Hudson was not attracted to the eyes of the animal. But he went over there, and he just, you can look in his face. That's the way he looked. He was, we had been throwing rotten apples around a few minutes before, like heaving them at signs and stuff like that. And so he was perfectly happy with picking up a, an apple and throwing it at something, but he certainly did not treat that rabbit like that. And it was very clear to me that he was absolutely zoned in on that thing, which I think you can see. So that's Wilson's ideas. We have some natural attraction to animals in our lives. The second theory, um, which is fairly popular, is that basically what pets do is they hijacked our parental instincts, probably maternal instincts, we could call it maternal instincts. And that is to say, we have evolved traits to be incredibly attracted and nurturing to creatures which share the, characteristics, the physical characteristics of our infant children. And so what you can see is that, they, that an animal like a kitten or a pug with those big eyes you know, definitely has some of the characteristics. So, and the fact that, you know, when I would show some of these pictures, some of you were going, oh, it's always women. Seriously, it's always women. I never hear guys going, oh, I never hear that. It's always women. You see the pictures, oh. This, I, I think this, this view of the fact that we've evolved, we have pets because they're basically surrogate children is, I think, nicely illustrated by that uh, woman in Amazonia, that, that uh, uh, woman uh, who had, is suckling her own child on one breast, and that, I think that's a spider monkey, but I'm not sure that spider monkey on the, other, on the other breast. So that's a possible idea. There is evidence of this idea that there's an instinctive attraction to things that are cute. There's, human instincts are sort of hard to prove, but this is pretty good evidence for this. So take a look at these, at these pictures. These are, un, these, are, these are unretouched pictures of these two kids, that kid and that kid. This picture has been slightly changed, and this picture has been slightly modified. All right, now we're going to take a little vote as to which is the cutest, this one or this one. How many of you say A is the cutest? A is the cutest? One person? How many say C is the cutest? Man, you're a minority here. <laughs> Why is C? I, I can hardly tell the difference in those. What is the difference between, why, is, why does everybody say, most everybody say that C is cuter? Yeah. I think it's the eyes. The eyes, are, the eyes are slightly bigger, aren't they? Anything else that you see? Yes. The, che the cheeks are chubbier? Mm -hmm. Cheeks are, anything else? What's that? The cute kid's ears are smaller? Mm -hmm. yes. Really? I never noticed that. Whoa, I think you're right. I, th I think you're right. One thing I think I've noticed, you can see it more here, is that the cranium seems to be bigger. And if you look at that picture of Hudson, you know, looking at the bunny, one thing that strikes me about that picture is that, you know, his, his head, looked re head looks really big. Well, what these researchers at University of Pennsylvania did was they put women in MRI, functional MRI machine, functional MRI, and they subtracted they subtracted responses to this one and this one so that they could look at what part of the brain preferentially lights up when you see these two. And what they found, it was this area, dopamine-rich area towards the base of the brain called the uh, nucleus accumbens, which is the brain's reward center. It's the same center that lights up when you get an A on the test. It's the same center that lights up when you, somebody pats you on the head and says you've done a good job. So let's take a quick, a quick uh, survey. Let's take a vote here. Uh, these are, this is from a study done by John Archer in England. OK, quickly, which is the cutest? We got a uh, cat, adult cat. We got it. What's that, golden retriever, I'm thinking, puppy, German shepherd, and a King Charles Cavalier Spaniel, lady and the tramp dog. How many say cat's the cutest, adult cat? How many say the golden retriever puppy is the cutest? I don't even go any further. <laughs> German Shepherd and King Charles Cavalier. By the way, 
which dog suffers the which animal suffers the most on a daily which dog wakes up in the morning in pain and goes to bed every night in pain why because they've been selectively bred because we want we like animals that are cute and they've been selectively bred to have this weirdly shaped skull and there, if you look at the brain of this guy it is squished down halfway into the spinal cord in fact, one researcher, Elaine Oshfrander, she compares their brains to the brain of a hydrocephalic child. And so they're, 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 many of them are in constant, basically constant headaches. So the dogs are great. And oftentimes we find that these animals that have been bred for sheer beauty suffer. Yes? And is that typical with any spaniel? No, these have, these have, no, 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 this is a particular one. But you see the same, I'm, I'll talk later about some other examples of this. Okay, so which one's the cutest? You got the ones that, that uh, Archer found. He had a bigger sample of things, but he found the puppies were the cutest, followed by these guys and the adult dogs and adult dogs and cats. Okay, evolutionary hypothesis number three is that pets increase our reproductive fitness. And this was investigated by a, uh, two, two social psychologists from France who did a very clever study. First, they recruited a really hot guy. And they actually got about 10 guys they thought were hot. And then they had like a beauty contest and they paraded them with, but, but, by a bunch of women. And the women voted for which guy was the hottest, which is this guy, Antoine. <laughs> so one of the researchers had a dog. This is, they sent me the picture of the dog. The dog name was Gwindu. <laughs> nobody, nobody goes on. You guys are saps, man. You guys are really suckers. So Gwen Du's French nickname, unfortunately, is Doudou. And I don't really tell people. It doesn't translate well into English. And, they, and what happened was, was, was it was a, a controlled social psychology study, as you said. So if you guys like your experiments, right, this is a good one. They had uh, Antoine walk up to single women in a mall outside of Paris, shopping mall, and walked up to the women, and they were randomly selected, uh, and said, uh, bonjour, this is my French, bonjour. Je m'appelle Antoine. That's the end of my French right there. <laughs> and my, my name is Antoine, and I find you, I find you attractive. Uh, I've got to go to work right now. However, perhaps we could get together later, later this afternoon, later this evening, and if you give me your, your phone number, uh, I'll give you a call, and perhaps we can go out for a drink. And in half the cases, he was with him by, you know, by himself. In the other half of the case, he was accompanied by the dog, Gwindu. And the dependent variable was simple, what percent of women gave their number to Antoine? This is the answer. <laughs> when Antoine, when Anton was by himself, I think 10% walking up the ramp. We would call this sexual harassment today, I suspect maybe it might not, might not go by the IRB, you know, I'm not sure. Um, when he was with, when he was with, the, with by himself, 10% of the women say yes, his, his hit rate he didn't actually go out with them, by the way. Um, his hit rates tripled when he was with the dog. A recent study by Peter Gray at, uh, at University of Las Vegas, University of Nevada, Las Vegas, he was contacted by Match.com and PetSmart if they would work with him on the use of pet pictures in terms of dating profiles on Match.com. And I want, the data was really cool, um, but they found basically that 27% of women that they surveyed said that photos of pets in an online dating profile, if a guy had a pet, that made him hotter. 35% uh, of the women had said they had been more attracted to someone out of a pet. And um, uh, that, I think about 7% of women said that they had actually used their pet to attract men. And about 25% of men said they had used a pet to attract a woman. And then they asked a really important question. They asked about 600 women, what's the sexiest pet a guy can have? the sexiest pet a guy can have. I got the good news and the bad news. The good news is that dogs by far were the sexiest pets. The next one was cats, but they were way lower than dogs. But if you have a rabbit, you're a loser. Aw. Rabbits are cute. They're not hot though. They might be cute, but they're not hot. They're definitely not hot. So, so if you're a guy, don't get a rabbit. Don't get a rabbit. I also avoid a bird or a reptile or even a cat. Okay, so, so evolutionary theory number four 
as we hear a lot because this is what the pet products industry is constantly pushing on us. And that's the idea that pets improve human health. And I come across these things every day. Claims in the media, uh, seven ways to pet improve your health, get, a, get healthy, get a dog. The idea that people that live with pets are healthier and happier than people that don't have pets. And when I was writing my book, one of the areas of human-animal interactions I never wanted to study because everybody else seemed to be studying it was pets. But I was writing this book, and I thought, all right, I got to look at the pet literature. What a drag. Everybody else is doing it. I can't contribute anything to that. But I had to look at the literature. And I know the people. I've known them for decades, people that do this work. But pets, I know the people that have the early studies of pet owners survive from heart attacks and stuff like that. And I totally believed that. But then I started accumulating the published papers. And what I found was in my desk, in the, on the floor of my writing room, I had three stacks of papers. One that showed that pets were good for people. And sure enough, there are studies that show pet owners have better survivorship from heart attacks. They're less lonely. They have lower blood pressure. They're happier. They go to the doctor less. They have lower stress levels. They sleep better, increase self-esteem, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. But then I wound up with a stack of papers that found of studies that found no differences between pet owners and non-owners. And then I came across a bunch of, well, let me just say, then I came across, a, but this, I'm, what I'm doing, I'm shifting gears here and talking about some of the problems we have with these evolutionary theories, and I want to talk about this one. So um, I came across another group of, of research papers that showed pet owners were worse off, that pet owners didn't survive heart attacks at greater rates, that they actually died at greater rates. You never see that. You never saw that study advertised in the, in the, you know, in the media, the newspaper. They found, these studies found that pet owners were lonelier, that they had more in panic attacks. They're more likely to, likely to have insomnia. They're more likely to have migraines. There is no study which has shown that pet owners live longer than non-owners. So the evidence that pets are actually good for people is very, very mixed. I'm sure they're good for some people, but they're bad for some people. For example, as one of you pointed out to me earlier, 85,000 Americans are taken to the hospital each year because they trip over their pets. It's happened to two of my friends. Does anybody know, here know? I'm curious. I've never done this before. Does anybody know somebody that was injured by tripping over their pet? Whoa! Holy mackerel! That's stunning. That's about a third of you. So it's not all sweetness and light. And my friend John Bradshaw, who's just written an incredibly great uh, book that just came out last week on human-pet relationships, he argues that the stresses of pet ownership probably cancel out any pet benefit. So I'm not buying this pets are good for our health, and that's why pet owning evolved anymore. Another problem is that pet keeping is not a human universal. Uh, I've got a friend, Niaga Maniki, a uh, faculty member at Western Carolina University, where I taught for many years. He's an anthropologist, and he's also from Kenya, and he was raised in a village similar to this one. And I interviewed about pets in his village, and he said, well, we don't have pets. He said, we don't have, we don't have a word for pet in our language. I said, do you have dogs in your village? He says, yes. Are they pets? He said, no. Do you let them in your house? No. He said, no, we wouldn't let them in the house. I said, why do you have them? He says, well, we have them around because they chase away strangers. They really like mean, vicious dogs. They chase away, whoa, they, they, chase, they chase away strangers. Excuse me. They chase away strangers, and um, they chase away wild animals from our gardens and things like that. I said, well, would you, let, would you feed, the, feed, your, feed your dog at the table? He said, no, of course not. I said, would you ever let the dog sleep in your bed? And he, the look on his face was just stunning. It was just like this look of utter disgust. Like, like I said, like, hey, I just found this really cool slug, you know? Would you like to... You know, like let it crawl on your face for the next couple of minutes. You know, that's the look that he gave. That's the look that the look that he gave me. They, they have no word for his pet, for the word pet in, in, in his language. Uh, Peter Gray at University of Nevada did a great study of 60 human cultures, and he was interested in styles of pet keeping in these cultures. 60, of the, uh, I think 55 of these cultures. Now all these all these societies had dogs. But the dogs were more like treated like they were in Kenya than in the United States. So the, the most common use of a dog was for hunting and defense, scaring away strangers. The dogs may have had jobs like herding and things like that. Waste removal, they used them to, they used them to, uh, 
you know, to, to eat up garbage and things like that. And only three of these cultures did people play with dogs the way we play with dogs. So the way we think about pets is really an anomaly. It's not a human universal at all. It's one that's become widespread in the world, but it's not always been like that. Finally, another problem that I have with these biological evolutionary theories of pet ownership is that there's been these large historical shifts in pet owning. So for example, in ancient Egypt, cats were absolutely um, worshiped. People kept them as pets. They thought of them as deities. Unfortunately for cats, they also liked the idea of burying people with cats. And so they actually had a, 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 an industry associated with raising cats for the burial business, but they really venerated cats. In the Middle Ages, on the other hand, cats were vilified. Cats were linked with witchcraft, and Pope Gregory in the 13th century declared war on cats, genocide. Over three million cats, it's likely, were killed in Europe, and they were killed horribly. They were hung, they were burned at the stake, they were put in bags, and they were thrown into rivers. The idea of torturing a cat became something that was the right thing to do. On the other hand, about 150 years ago, cats, cats began to be widely accepted and again, John Bradshaw, my colleague, argues that it was only about 150 years ago that pet, cat, pets became widely cats became widely accepted as pets in the Western world, for example, the United States and Great Britain. Finally, there's enormous individual differences in people's attachments to pets. For example, in my family, I'm more attached to my pet, my cat, than my wife is. Uh, she's, not, she's not an animal person. Of my three kids, one of my three kids, they're all great, you know, raised in the same family. One of my three kids is a real animal person. The other, the, other two, the other two are not. And I've been taken to asking people, how many of you know somebody who lives with an animal that they don't like or that they're afraid of? How many would you say you know somebody that lives with an animal that they either don't like or they're afraid of? This is about what I typically find. Usually I find about a third of people in a class or an audience fit in that category. So if there was a lot of natural selection for being a pet lover, I would expect pet keeping to be much more widespread than it is now. So I argue that biology cannot explain these vast cultural differences and these historical changes that we see in pet keeping. E.O. Wilson, the guy that came up with biophilia, he later changed his mind about bio, biophilia, being an, biophilia being an instinct. And he wrote in a subsequent book in 1993, Biophilia is not a single instinct, but a complex set of cultural learning rules that can be teased apart and analyzed individually. So that makes more sense. That could explain why this kid has this giant beetle that's his pet in Japan, and why this woman is cooking that dog for dinner in Korea. So I'm not seeing this biophilia thing playing out as some sort of instinct for pet love. So what can explain our love for pets if it's not evo our evo you know, hardcore evolutionary theory? Well, Wilson suggested that there's cultural learning rules. And so what in recent years, some of my colleagues and I have been doing is we've been trying to tease apart some of these learning rules. And, uh, in addition to Paul Raza, one of my other sort of heroes in, in uh, behavioral science is Richard Dawkins. And Dawkins, in the last uh, chapter of his book, The Selfish Gene, came up with this idea of a meme. And you've all heard the term meme. It's become a meme. It's become widespread. I, you hear it all the time. They're ideas that go viral and become widespread. He invented that term. Now, whether memes are real or metaphorical, I don't care. But I'm using them, I'm going to use them as a way of, of just thinking about our Treatment of animals. So, so memes could be, for example, one meme that comes up and down is the meme for wearing animal skins. Right now, it's, believe it or not, it's going up again. I never thought I would be eating raw fish, but my guess, I, I get it all the time at Ingalls. And then there's songs or memes. Songs are snatches of a song. That can, you know, memes are, can be snatches of a song that sort of get in your head and sort of get passed and passed around. So, why not, does anybody have a birthday today? Is this anybody's birthday? Somebody, actually, there's enough people here. It might be. Nobody's going to admit it. I know someone's birthday. Well, let's pretend it's your birthday. What's your name? Sydney. Sydney. S Sydney's birthday, right? Sure. Okay, we're going to sing her a birthday song. Okay, ready? Happy, ready? <laughs> One, two, three. Happy birthday to That's enough. That's enough. You really good singers. This is the best singing group I've ever. So. <laughs> So, 
you all sang the same song. None of you sang Stevie Wonder's birthday song. <laughs> None of you sang John, the beat, you know, John Lennon's birthday song. You know that one, Today is Your Birthday. You know that song? Da, da, da. <laughs> Nobody sang that. You all sang this song that was written in 1927. What you just did a couple years ago would have been illegal because you're not allowed to sing Happy Birthday unless you have a license from the MGM Corporation. But this song has spread. It's become an incredibly successful meme. Well, what I argue is that trendy pets can be memes. The, a craze for pot-bellied pigs, caged birds, Dalmatians, bearded dragons, that lizard that became popular, and even at one point in the United States, pet rocks. So what my colleagues and I have been doing is we've been using probably one of the biggest sets ever used in the history of psychology to study how our attitudes towards pets have changed. And I was incredibly fortunate that the American Kennel Club, about 10 years ago, sent me the mother load of data. So when I go in and I talk about this stuff, you know, normal sample size, what would be a big sample size in one of your studies? 150. 150, that's a big sample size. My data set consists of 62 million. My N equals 62 million. Way bigger than yours, 62 million. And it's every, it's every dog, every purebred dog registered with the American Kennel Club between 1927 and 2005. So, and we have the breed of the dog and when it was registered. And so what I did was I hooked up with some people that are way smarter than me, these mathematical uh, social scientists, anthropologists, and in some case geneticists, and we began mining this data using models derived from evolutionary biology that, to design flow of genes, to look at genes flowing through populations. We applied that to our choices in pets. And so we have data from 160 breeds, uh, 62 million, all these puppy registrations. Well, what did we learn from these? Number one is that our choices in pets are a form of popular culture. It's an ever-changing cultural landscape, an ever-changing cultural landscape that shifts around just like the music that we listen to or the movies that we go see. And so pop cultures phenomena tend to follow a type of distribution that psychologists need to pay more attention to. How many of you guys know what a normal curve is? It's like the most important thing you learn in psychology. How many of you heard of power laws in any of your psychology classes? Hardly any of you. Power laws explain an enormous amount of human behavior and they're really underestimated. Um, and so for example, the name you give your kid is a fact, is a, it doesn't follow a normal distribution, it follows a power law distribution. The name that you have is followed. The music that you listen to doesn't follow uh, uh, a normal curve, it follows a power law distribution. These are called long tail distributions. As you can see, they're incredibly skewed. And they typically follow some, so, so for example, here's a few examples, baby names, web page hits, pop songs. Uh, I noticed from the, the blog I write for Psychology Today, um, Follows a clear power law. Some of, these, some of the blogs are incredibly popular. Some of the posts are popular. Other posts that are just as good or better, never, they're, they're like this guy. So here we have, what we find in power laws is they tend to follow 80-20 distributions or something like that. And what that means is that 20% of the available choices, in this case, this is the top 100 dog breeds in 1990, well, 20% of these take up 80% of the actual choices. So 80% of the breeds, 80% of the dogs, excuse me, follow, or fall into these 20 breeds. This was Labrador Retrievers were number one. In that case, St. Bernard's were like in the middle of the pack. And this little guy, Norwich Terrier, which is Toto in uh, Wizard of Oz, a perfectly good dog, has languished in obscurity and is still languishing in obscurity. Now, what's the difference? Why the hell did labs get so popular and not this cute little Norwich Terrier. What we did, what my smart guys, my, my smart uh, guys did, is that they plugged in their mathematical models used for, to calculate gene flows in populations, and they found that this followed what biologists call the random drift model of evolution. In this case, it applies to cultural evolution. And what we argue is that dog breeds get pop popular primarily because of random chance. For some reason, something sets them off, and then sometimes they go viral and that there's no inherent relationship between the quality of the dog and whether or not it gets popular. So this is an example. This is the graph that changed my life. You don't see, have you ever seen a graph like that? Never in real data, never. 
I saw this, this graph popped up when I started graphing all 160 degrees. And I grabbed it. It was like Archimedes, you know, when he runs around with all his friends saying, I have found it. That's what I did in the psych department at Western. I went around knocking on doors saying, look at this graph. And nobody gave a shit about it. <laughs> <laughs> nobody cared, but I did. And so it turns out that when dog breeds go viral, this is, these are the distributions, the changes in distributions over time. These are number of registrations. This is years over time. So this is 11 different breeds. And you can see they go up and they go down. It takes a dog roughly 25, excuse me, this whole cycle takes about 25 years, about 13 years for it to get hot and about 12 years for it to get, to get not. So a couple other things that we found, just really quickly, there's a lot of data here is that the impact of Disney movies actually has an effect. So we looked at 29 dog movies, and we, looked, we found that of dog movies that showed this sort of distribution, first day ticket sales affected breed popularity 10 years later. For, an, for a breed that had high, ten first, you know, high first day ticket sales, 10 years later, they were still more popular. But for the top 10 breeds, that translated into 80,000 new puppies being registered with the AKC, 800,000. Interestingly enough, the Disney effect has declined a lot in recent years because there's too many movies. So it doesn't, individual movies don't have the same impact. And the big question for me is why do things get popular? So for example, some things get popular because they're just better. Like I got an iPhone, I can't believe my iPhone, what it can do. You know, I can say, you know, Siri, tell me, tell me what I need to know about power law distributions. And she'll tell me what, about power law distributions or tell me where to go. It's way better than that old rotary phone that I thought was pretty cool back in the day. So it got better because it's, it got popular because it's better. On the other hand, things get popular for no reason at all. I would put tattoos into that category. You have tattoos. How many of you have tattoos? You have tattoos because other people have tattoos, I would argue. Fedora hats were incredibly popular. If you were running for political office in the 1950s, you had to have a fedora hat. Wear one now. See how far that gets you. <laughs> So, do better dog, we were able to address the issue, do better dogs get popular? And we used the University of Pennsylvania uh, index of owner evaluations. It turns out that some breeds are easier to live with than others. Um, we had 9,000 dogs from uh, 92 breeds. We had data on their, their, their behavior and their, and their health. So, for example, owners complain that chihuahuas, they have problems with dog rivalry, they get into fights. Aggression, they're fearful, separation anxiety, they chase. They're, these are bad things. The only good thing is trainability, which they score bad on. And the other hand, poodles, you know, they score low on all the bad things, and they're very trainable. So we were wondering whether, if you look at these dog breeds as a group, we would predict, if people were rational actors, that they would pick dogs that were easy to live with, that had a lot of, you know, that had low, low this stuff and high that sort of thing, and that they would have low, not, not many genetic disorders. Well, what did we find? We found there was no relationship between behavior and breed popularity. Little yappy dogs that bite you every time you come in the room were just as popular as dogs that are sweet. Popular breeds had more, not less, than genetic disorders. And that our conclusion is that our choices in pets, a really important thing in your life, is really affected by imitation and and uh, a victory, basically, of style over substance. And I want to finish up pretty quickly here. Sometimes really bad ideas can become popular. And my favorite example is the English Bulldog. Um, they have dental problems, sleep apnea, snoring, dermatitis, joint disease, cataracts, cleft palates. They fart a lot. And then they suddenly will drop over dead. So you would think a dog with all those problems would become less popular. That's the trajectory for, and it's continued to go up since this ended in 2005. It's continued to go up. Even worse than this is the French Bulldog. Anybody here have a French Bulldog? Oh, I bet it's cute. I mean, Three, but they're all cute. I think that's our mascot. But they have, they have, you're, that's right, that's right, you're the Bulldogs. Oh, I'm sorry, I should not have, oh. Oh, you're gonna kick me out. I'm never gonna be back at UNCA, I apologize. Bulldogs are really sweet dogs. Um, <laughs> The good news is they usually die at an early age, so they save you some money, but... <laughs> there you go. Oh, God, I'm breaking all the rules. Oh, good change. Okay, so, so we have a recent shift in dog fashions, and that is AKC registrations are dropping 
dropping like flies. And the AKC doesn't like me anymore. They regret giving me that data. And they no longer make this data publicly available, by the way. Because <laughs> they don't want you to know that their, 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 their numbers are crashing. So why is the purebred boom gone bust? You know the reasons why. Uh, health problems associated with purebreds, uh, bad publicity associated with puppy mills. And then there's the moral superiority of pet adoption. And the I would argue that the next big thing is rescue pets. And I have a going bet with my wife. And I say, look, Mary Jean, when I ask, I've asked hundreds, probably thousands of people over the years about their dogs. And it used to be people would always tell me, like, oh, I've got a purebred lab, I've got a purebred this, I've got a purebred that. Now, usually within, this, within two sentences, somebody, they will, they will mention the word rescue or adoption or shelter. Where's Patrick? You here? What? I'm He's right there. So, and that happened, that happened when you were telling me about your dog. And in the first two sentences, I'm not sure, I didn't parse it out whether it was the first sentence or the second sentence. You threw that line in there, there's a rescue. And I think there's, and I think, by the way, this is a good meme. This is a good thing, and this is the reason why it's a good thing. This is a good thing, because in the 1970s, we were putting 23 million dogs a year to sleep in animal shelters, and we're now down to less than 3 million. So sometimes memes can be good. Sometimes they can be horrible. And examples of horrible things, uh, here's Lady Gaga and the French Bulldog. Uh, we're seeing these increasing popularity of what are called flat-nosed breeds that have lots of problems. I am freaked out by the fact that you can buy genetically engineered fish at Walmart that glow in the dark. And the worst for me is a fad for living creatures, turtles, as jewelry in Japan and China, where they encase them in plastic and they die. What do they wear them? They wear them for keychains, things like that, necklaces. So let's get back to the original question. I want to have a few, little bit of time for questions. Let's get back to the original question. Why do humans keep pets and chimpanzees don't? I would argue that pet keeping requires a suite of characteristics, some of which non-human animals have. Parental instincts, attachment to other species. They can become attached to other species. Empathy. Imitation is some animal, an, animals have this to some degree. Humans have it to a highly advanced degree. And finally, cultural transmission. And so I argue that cultural transmission is way more important. That's what separates us from the other creatures. So I'm making the argument for human exceptionalism. So my answer to why pets, I don't think we're hard, unlike my colleague John Bradshaw, I do not think humans are hardwired to love animals. I think pet keeping evolved as a co-evolution through genes and culture, and the culture's been more important. And, the pet, and, the, and I'm a human exceptionalist when it comes to pets. I think the trait of characteristics, especially imitation and cultural, and, and cultural transmission and a moral sense is required for pet keeping. And quickly, I want, to I want to suggest that you should stop everything that you're doing and start studying human-animal interactions for a number of reasons if you're in, you're in psychology. One is that, as I mentioned, animals offer a window, I think, in virtually every, almost every aspect of human psychology. When you tell your friends and your family about the research you're doing now, their eyes are probably going to glaze over and they're not going to care very much. You start studying this stuff, you're going to become very popular at parties. <laughs> and this is still a small field. And you, I was very lucky to get in this very small pond very early. And so this is, a, this is you know, you're, it's, hard to make, it's hard to make a dent contribute to neuroscience or to social psychology as a broad field. There's, there's already thousands of people in there, some, many of which are smarter than you. But here we have a bunch of people that are really passionate, and you can make a difference in that field. Finally, I do write this, uh, this blog for Psychology Today, Animals and Us. Uh, check it out. And then finally, what do we got? Oh, questions. We got, <laughs> I talked five minutes longer than I wanted to. Questions? Yes? Well, first of all, we don't know much about we don't know much about the popularity. Okay, but I, I, th that's a great question because why do breeds become unpopular? I think there's two reasons. One is there's a thing called the law of fashion cycles, 
and I didn't have time to talk about it. We've actually done a study on this. It turns out that the faster a breed gets popular, the faster it becomes unpopular. And the same thing is true of baby names. The faster a name gets popular, the faster it drops by. But sometimes there's other things. So for example, Rottweilers became very popular. The number of animals, the number of people killed by Rottweilers went up. Insurance companies started taking away your home insurance, and that's why their popularity drops. Pit bulls is unclear because we don't, I don't know how many pit bulls there are. There's a lot of de debate about what is a pit bull. Um, but I would expect their popularity might start to go down, but I'm, I'm not sure. Exactly, exactly. No, I, th I, think that, I think that's exactly correct, yes. Other, other yes? So why do you think certain pets develop, like, I guess, quirky behaviors that are kind of human viewing, but kind of different from what we're doing? Yeah, let me, I, I, okay, let me just say number one is I don't know the answer to that, um, because I'm not a dog behaviorist. However, I do have an answer for that. One, re one reason why dogs develop per quirky behaviors is because they're small. And, and the CBARC data from University of Pennsylvania shows overwhelmingly the dogs that are most likely to have behavior problems are small dogs. Like the dogs most likely to bite their owners are chihuahuas and dachshunds. Pit bulls get the bad reputation, but they're about the same as poodles when it comes to, to actual aggression in terms of biting. On the other hand, they cause more damage because they're smaller. So I think one reason that small dogs have more problems, especially irritating, quirky problems, is because people are more willing to put up with it. Does that make sense? Like if you're a big dog and you start biting people, they're going to get rid of you. And so my guess is that there hasn't been the same sort of uh, selection, intense selection against bad behavior in the bigger breeds. So dog smaller, the only thing I really know about that is that Smaller dogs tend to have more psychological problems. Other, other questions? Yes. Um, I was wondering about the crickets as pets. Um, and I read a study about the benefit of having crickets as pets. Oh. I was dying in Korea. Oh, yeah. And the results were, were really kind of stunning. Yeah, um, worst guy. Let me, let me describe that study. So, yeah. so um, I did report on it. I was just struck by that paper. So one of the problems that we have in this field, especially associated with animal-assisted therapy, and whether you know, you know, interacting with pets is actually good, for example, for old people, is that the studies are typically lousy. They don't have good controls. They don't have enough subjects, things like that. Well, these guys, and, and almost all these studies involve dogs. And so when people think about pets, and you hear these things, pets are good for you, they're almost always talking about dogs. They're not even thinking about cats. You know? Well, this Koreans did a study, and they had a pretty big sample size, where they gave old people crickets. And crickets have a history of being pets in Korea. People like crickets. They sing. They, they're sort of they're, they're liked, unlike here. And so they gave each of these older people, they were randomly assigned a control group and an experimental group. They gave each one a group of five crickets, cage, food, et cetera, instructions how to take care of them. And these people took the, I think the study went on for five weeks. You've read it more recently than I have, yeah. something like that. Went on for five weeks. And sure enough, the, the people that took care of the crickets showed many of the, in fact, as much of the sorts of benefits that studies of the dogs have done. Now, crickets have tremendous advantages. If you want to get, you know, dogs are a pain in the neck, especially if you're an old person. You're not going to trip over your pet cricket, you know? <laughs> They're, they're cheap, they're easy to feed. When the crickets would die, they would just give them another cricket, you know, in the study. <laughs> wasn't, a, wasn't a big deal. So I really loved that study because for one thing is I thought it, I thought it sort of blew, blew apart this myth that, you know, animals like dogs have this magical healing power because crickets don't have any damn magical healing power. <laughs> uh, Alan Beck, one of the guys I really like in my field, he argues that the reason why pets are good for people, may help with depression and stuff like that, it's not any magical stuff. It's just that they give you something to think about that's not yourself. Yeah. There's similar studies with plants. Yes, and there's pl yes, there are. Exactly, exactly. And I would love, one of the problems that we don't have is we have very few, I don't know if, I, I, there are studies where they, where they compared uh, dogs versus robotic dogs. And the robotics dogs do pretty well, but I have not seen any studies where they compared uh, pets versus plants. But I, I think you would get the same effect with plants. In fact, John Bradshaw, said, you know, in his new book, he says, like, if you really want to benefit from something associated with nature, you're better off taking a walk in the woods rather than, which the benefits are substantial, rather than getting, let's say, a dog. Even caring for plants. 
Yeah, no, I know what you're saying. That. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 I, I, I understood that. Yes, yes. Um, That's great. And, like, we've been telling people about the mental and emotional health benefits, like, in addition to, like, improving air quality, there have been, like, some comparisons, like, when you have something small to take care of. Yes. It helps because it gives you routine. Yes, absolutely. 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 Like, absolutely. Like, absolutely. Like, absolutely. No, I, 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 one of the things that drives me, I'm on a mission right now. It's, it's me versus, it's not me, it's me and John Bradshaw against the pet food companies. You can tell who's going to win. But they're put, they want everybody, like the head of the, uh, the, the main pet food lobby group, he's on record as saying everybody should have a pet t t for their health. That's ridiculous. It's absolutely rid ridiculous. And, and we have one, one of the problems we have in terms of bias, in addition to, to bad research, not enough controls, is we have publication bias that only the positive studies get published. And then it's the positive studies that get cited by researchers. So I think, it's, I think it's the fault of researchers uh, to some extent. A lot of times studies that, and this drives me really nuts, a lot of times studies will find no effect. But yet, so, so you look at the introduction, you look at the abstract, it looks like it's all good. And then you look at the data, it's like, damn, man, you didn't find anything. There wasn't any effect. Then they'll, they'll have one sentence, they'll say like, well, we didn't find any significant differences. However, and then they'll go extol how great the study was and how much people liked the animals. This is, a, this is called spin. And it's, it's rampant in journals. It's not just psychology journals, it's rampant in medical journals, which is even more of a problem. I'm going to have to break in here and get out of the room, but let's give Dr. Herzog a Thank you. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for coming out. Have a good day. Sorry about the bulldog thing. <laughs> Don't tell anybody I said it. <laughs>